I look back at what I went through, you know, I mean, uh, a young man from the South Bronx, through the slums and the boondocks of Vietnam, through the dinky gyms, through the, 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 the little club fights, to the top of the world. I've accomplished it. I'm satisfied. Sal Mombi's story begins in the South Bronx in New York. His mother was born in Spain and converted to Judaism when she came to the United States. His father was Jamaican and he converted to the religion as well. I had to fight every day, Mombi said, especially on the Sabbath. Coming home from the temple, kids would follow me down the street and I'd have to tell them to wait a minute until I change clothes. Then I'd come outside and we'd fight. After a while, they stopped following me. Mombi believes his last name is of African origin. His first name, Saul, may be a misspelling of a biblical king. Ever since I was small, Mombi said, my mother said I would be a warrior. At the age of 16, Mombi began boxing, compiling an amateur record of 25 and 5. He would use his middle name, Paul, and win a sub-novice title in the Golden Gloves. He would then be drafted into the Vietnam War, serving in the infantry. Mumby remembers sitting around with his fellow soldiers, joking and talking about what they were going to do after the war. But after seeing some of his buddies leave the country in body bags, Mumby made a vow to himself to lead the life he wanted if he got out alive. I didn't want to be the shoulda, coulda, woulda, Mumby said, because when it's over, it's over. I made it out of a hellhole, so whatever I want to do, I'm going to do, as long as it's not hurting me or anybody else. Mombi would be discharged from the army and become a professional boxer in 1969. He was 22 years old and honed his skills at Stillman's and Gleason's gym in New York. But fighting in the less than prestigious junior welterweight division, Mombi found it hard to make a living. He would turn to driving as an unlicensed cabbie to make ends meet. He would pick up the people other taxi drivers avoided. But as crime increased in New York City, Mombi decided to give up driving the taxi. A lot of other drivers were getting shot at, Mombi said. So I quit. I figured my time was coming. He instead became focused on becoming boxing's globetrotter, a fighting gypsy that would go into an opponent's backyard at a moment's notice. As a result, his one loss record wasn't the greatest, and by 1976, he compiled a record of 18 wins against eight losses with five draws, he would lose decisions to all-time greats in Roberto Duran and Antonio Cervantes before getting a surprise title shot against WBC junior welterweight champion Sain Sak Muangzaran in Thailand. When I landed in Thailand, I was greeted like a king, Mombi said. The two weeks I was there before the fight, you would think I was champion. I walked down the street, turned around, and I had 100 people following me. Kids, young women. I'd go to the gym and I'd have more people watching me train, so they switched my training facilities to the stadium. It held about 3,000 people and every day I trained, it was packed. The biggest crowd I trained in front of was 50,000. It gave me the incentive. I thought, I want this belt. I'm going to fight my heart out. Mumby would later call the fight the best performance of his career. In his opinion, he won 12 of the 15 rounds against Muang Zuren. But the local judges didn't see things his way. They weren't going to let me win the title, Mombi said. Mombi would then sign a managerial deal with Carl King, son of promoter Don King, and Mombi was moved into the number one spot in the WBC ratings. Mombi then went on a six-fight win streak over the next two years before getting another title shot, this go-around at Sang Hyun Kim, the newly crowned champion out of Seoul, South Korea. But his manager, Carl King, didn't bother making the trip with Mombi to Seoul. Arriving with only his trainer and his girlfriend, Mombi did as he always did, go into his opponent's backyard and cross his fingers that he would get a fair shake. They did everything to me over there, Mombi said. Harassment and all these other tricks. They put me in a gym with no windows in it, a dingy hotel. I said, that's okay, I'm gonna win it. And behind on points, Mombi mounted a late rounds comeback. When he knocked Kim down, he thought the referee would give the local favorite extra time to recuperate. 
But then Kim's chief second came into the ring and waved the fight off. All the strength in my body left, Mombi said. I just fell to my knees and thanked God that I did it. I went back to the locker room in tears. The South Korean fans were livid, throwing objects into the ring. They would hit Mombi's trainer with a bottle. The police came and escorted Mombi back to the hotel where he would catch the next plane out. When I won the title, it was a shock. Nobody gave me uh, credit. Nobody even uh, thought I had the ability, but I did it. I proved, I beat the odds three million to one. And uh, it was a shock to the boxing world that I won. It wasn't a shock to me. And Mommy still faced a tough road ahead. The junior welterweight division was a weight class on the periphery, having only foreign fighters as champions. And Mombi's fighting style was frowned upon by American network executives. But for the first defense of his title, he would get his first nationally televised appearance against Esteban de Jesus. De Jesus was well known for handing Roberto Duran his first loss and came into the bout as a 7-5 favorite. The challenger weighed in at a quarter of a pound over the weight limit, and the commissioners discussed whether or not to have de Jesus sweat it off. But the champion quickly intervened. That's all right, Mombi said. I'll beat it off him. Scott Ledoux, the underdog. There, De Jesus tried to unload the, the knockout punch. We got about one minute and 30 seconds left in this, the 11th round. Scheduled for 15, neither fighter down. Portion of the glove, that's legal. Punches from everywhere. A buzzsaw is Saul Mambi. The fans beginning to love his skill. Always that chance. When a left is in your face, like Mumby's left is. Talk about counter punching, it's beautiful. And now taking the lead. Whereas Mumby, the champion, lost a 10 round decision to Roberto Duran. The Jesus now. Serious trouble, and down he goes with about 20 seconds of mandatory eight count. 15 seconds to go. You cannot be saved by the bell. Seven, the mandatory eight, and Rudy Ortega looks at the eyes of De Jesus, who's blinking them. Wobbly knees, spaghetti legs. And so he'll get a rest, much needed. There it is. Mombi's performance impressed New York Post writer Dick Young, who commented, Mombi's feet are always skimming across the ring, like a water spider on a lake. Three months later, Mombi would get more exposure as he appeared on the undercard of the Larry Holmes Muhammad Ali bout. He would take on the veteran Termite Watkins, who came into the ring with a stellar record of 50 wins against three losses. After the win, Mombi would be offered his biggest payday. New boxing promoter Harold Rossfield Smith offered him $1 million for a unification showdown with Aaron Pryor, but Pryor would get shot in his arm by his girlfriend. 
By the time Pryor was healed, Harold Smith was being investigated by the FBI for embezzling money from Wells Fargo. An eight-month layoff followed and Mobby thought about quitting fighting altogether, but he finally landed about, taking on veteran Joe Kimpuani in Detroit. Two months later, Mobby would get a $135,000 payday against Indonesia's Thomas Americo. Mobby was once again forced to go out of the country without a local fan base or network to support his efforts. Once in Jakarta, Indonesia, the fight's organizers put Mobby up in a luxury hotel and assigned a gorgeous young woman to take care of his every need. But Mombi smelled a plant. He had the girl wake him up for road work and drive him around, but nothing else. She was a beautiful woman, Mombi said, but I wasn't going to lose my title for one night of pleasure. Mombi would handle Thomas Americo with ease. Then four months later, he would head to Nigeria for what was promised to be his biggest payday as he defended the title against the challenge of Obesia Wangpa. The experience was a horrible one for Mombi. His hotel accommodations were atrocious. He was given a toilet for a bathroom with a stench so bad he had to hold his nose every time he entered. He couldn't drink the water or eat the food, having to subsist on Schweppes ginger ale for 10 days. People pounded on the side of his van when he was driving over to the weigh-in before trying to turn it over. But in the fight, Mombi would have his way with the Nigerian challenger, but escaped with only a split decision as the scorecards were tampered with. They were going to announce Wangpa as the victor just to avoid a riot. But Duke Durden, one of Don King's aides, insisted that the correct score be announced. It was the scariest moment of my life, Mombi said. They were going to announce Wangpa won anyway, so they pulled a gun on Duke in the ring. In 1982, Mombi would return home and take on the aggressive Leroy Haley. Both fighters were managed by Carl King, and Mombi sensed that some kind of backdeal shenanigans were afoot. Sal Mambi, the champion in white. Leroy Healy from Las Vegas in green. First change by both fighters landing on that one. Mambi with a short right hand to the ear inside. Best punches of the fight by Mambi, Tim. Healy just kind of resting on the ropes, waiting to explode, and there he comes out. As we see it, needs the knockout. Right, on, on our card, go. we have an 8-5-1 one with one, an 8-5 with one even. Haley in front, unofficial of course. Judge from Puerto Rico, one from Mexico, one from Cleveland will do the scoring for the WBC. Haley willing to slug with him here even in this final round, but now ties him up. Well, they told him in his quarter, let it all hang out. You want to be the champion, this is it. He's tired, Tim. He's really tired. He, he landed that right hand, but he came from across the street. Mouth wide open on the challenger. Leroy Haley takes a short chopping right from Mamby. Oh, he... Haley keeps throwing him. There's not much on his punches. Okay, he's smart, though, Tim. He's, he's staying inside smothering Mamby's punches. Another right hand by Haley. Timmy just lets Mamby walk right into them. Mamby looking out at Larry Holmes, who's seated next to it, for some kind of encouragement or advice, and he hasn't got enough time to be looking elsewhere. Battering inside against Haley, scoring to the body, but again smothered by Haley. Looks a little like Holmes throwing that right hand against Toomey. Another right hand land. Mamby trying desperately here, but he cannot hold off the onslaught of Haley. The crowd is on its feet here in the front row theater. 20 seconds to go in the fight. Watch your head. Leroy Haley will just not let the champion Mamby get anything going here. Mamby throwing punches desperately knocks the challenger into the ropes but not down. Final seconds of the fight. The referee Keel trying to separate them. Mamby trying to break loose. And that's it. It's all over. The audience is on its feet here in the front row theater. Judge Jose Dan scores the fight. 145, 142, Haley. Judge Roberto Ramirez scores the fight. 144, 143, Mandy. Judge Jimmy Bivens scores the fight. 
The uh, champion, former champion now has joined us here, Sal Mamby. Sal, uh, I heard you as you walked behind the cards as they were being read saying that they, they stole it from you. Is that your well, view? I think I won it, but, you know, it's political and a lot of things behind the scenes. What do you mean it's political? I'll talk about it later. Well, how did you feel about the, the course of the fight? I mean, did, you did feel that you won it. Yes, I did. And it, you said pulled it out. In other words, you're conceding you were behind early. Is that no, not really. I mean, um, I was taking my time figuring them out. I outboxed them. I, uh, I pulled it. Not that I pulled it out. I was beating them, I thought. Well, Sal, you've been a great champion. Uh, Leroy Haley uh, seemed to feel that uh, two Americans in a, in a title bout did a great job of entertaining boxing fans, and we certainly agree with them. Thank you. Well, good luck to you, Sal. The two would rematch eight months later. The fight was close, but didn't have the controversy of the first fight, as Haley once again took the decision. By 1984, Mombi seemed to be reduced to a stepping stone. He took a beating against Billy Costello, and retirement seemed to be the best option. Remember the night I won the title in Korea, Mombi said after the fight, with thousands of fans screaming for the other guy? They gave me that big championship trophy, and I had to take it apart to fill it in my suitcase to bring it home. And when we went home, I was exhausted. But before we went to sleep, I stayed up all night putting the damn trophy back together again. I'll miss it. I love boxing. Everything passed too soon. But Mommy would continue to toil in the sport. He would suffer the first knockdown of his career against Rene Arredondo, but insisted it was just a push. He would then ignore calls for his retirement calling attention to the fact that he looked great because he adhered to a strict diet of steamed vegetables and had unmatched conditioning. People say I'm old, Mombi said. I told them the wind is old. Mombi would then lose more than he won, but spring an occasional upset as he would defeat up-and-comers and contenders alike, such as Glenwood Brown, Larry Barnes, Reyes Cruz, and Gary Hinton, who would all suffer losses against an aged Mombi. Amazingly, he would fight on until the year 2000 after 30 years in the sport and finally retire at the age of 53. But there would be one last hurrah in 2008 when a 60-year-old Mombi got in the ring one last time and lost a 10-round decision in the Cayman Islands. Mombi would be reclusive in his final years, passing away at the age of 72. Former heavyweight champion Larry Holmes was one of the boxing dignitaries on hand to eulogize Mombi recalling their friendship that went back over 40 years. He taught me what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of, what to do and how to do it, Holmes said. I'm going to miss him. May he rest in peace.